Welcome, people of God and true New Englanders. It's good to have you here. Out of the snow and out of the cold, God has called us and invited us into the warmth of God's love, into the light of this community. God has called us together to sing and to pray, to share our joy and support one another in sorrow. God has called us together to be just who we are for the sake of one another and for the sake of the world. So welcome, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we're glad that you're here. I have just one announcement this morning, which is that our annual meeting has been rescheduled for February 21st after worship. That information is also in your bulletin and in an email. Uh, February 21st, immediately following worship, it's a chance for us to get together to reflect on the year that's gone past and to make some plans for the year ahead. And we will have lunch, so hope that you can make plans to join us at that time. Let our worship now continue as we sing and proclaim our joy. Please rise. By God's amazing grace, the lost are found. By God's extraordinary mercy, we are not forgotten. By God's power, we are redeemed. By God's love, we are made whole. Let us now, the ones in whom God delights, return our grateful praise.
Great is your faithfulness, shepherd God. You seek us when we are lost. You call to us when we listen for your voice. You guide us beside still waters. You bring us to peace. Give us ears to hear you and hearts ready to follow. Fill us with love for you like you are filled with love for us. Make us each day better followers of your child Jesus, the one who led us into fuller love, who showed us boundless compassion, who fed us and healed us and who guides us still. In the name of Christ, our shepherd, we pray. Amen. Friends, Christ's peace is here among us and Christ's peace is here to stay. Will you take a moment to share a sign of that peace with one another? May the peace of Christ be with you. my children's sermon this morning, and somehow I lost all of them, except for just this one. So kids, while you're coming up this morning, if you could just do me a favor and take a look around the sanctuary, see if you can help me find some of the lost sheep. And if you find them, can you bring them up when you come to sit with me? When you find some, some missing sheep, let's all come and sit up here together. Let's see if we have most of them. I think we might got, I think we may have them all. Let's see. Let's hold them up. Let's see how many we have here. Some of you found a lot, wow. Yeah, it's a big stack. Does everyone have at least one? Yeah. Good, good. All right, I'm just gonna stick mine right there. So in the Bible, Jesus said that God is like a shepherd. Does anyone know what a shepherd is? Yeah. Person that like keeps the sheep. Yeah, a person who keeps the sheep. What, what are some of the things that you think a shepherd does for sheep? Yeah, feeds them, leads them to a pasture. What else might a shepherd do for sheep? You keep them safe. Yeah. Raise them, right? Help the help the little sheep grow up into adults. Yeah. Wonderful. 
So if God is like a shepherd, then God takes care of us like we were God's sheep. Now, Jesus told his friends a story. He said that there was a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. And one day he realized when he looked around that there were only 99 of them there. And one of them was missing. So the shepherd had a hundred sheep. There were 99 there and just one of them was missing. And that shepherd dropped everything and went out looking everywhere for that one lost missing sheep until he found it. And when he found it, he put it over his shoulders and he walked back and brought it back to all the other sheep. And then he called all his friends and he said, come and have a party with me because I found my missing sheep. Let's celebrate because the sheep that was lost is now found. Now, you all did such a good job of finding my lost sheep, and I'm thankful for that. And I want you to take these sheep, and everyone has at least one, and maybe some of you have a few more, and just remember that we are like all the sheep in God's flock. You can keep them, yeah. We are like all the sheep in God's flock, and so whenever we are feeling lost, or if you're ever feeling lonely, or scared, or alone, Know that God is like a great shepherd who will come looking for you no matter what, and God will love you always. Let's say a prayer together. God, our shepherd, we give you thanks that you seek us out when we're lost, that you always find us, and that you always bring us home, and that you love us so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Man. Thank you so much. You can go to class. As we prepare our hearts to hear the word that God is speaking to us today, let us join together in prayer. God, your scripture says that the sheep know the shepherd's voice. Grant that we would know your voice. Attune our ears so that we can hear your love above all the other voices that would tell us differently. Open our hearts to receive your words, not just to hear, but to listen. Not just to listen, but to be moved. Speak now, Holy Shepherd. Your servants are listening. Amen.
The word in scripture, scripture comes from Luke 15, 1 through 7, and 11, 32. Now all the tax collector, collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and I'll go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put on a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat, so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Earlier this week, I was having lunch with one of our church members, and we started talking about parables. Now, last Sunday, I, I let you know that I plan to preach about the parables of Jesus for the next three weeks. Each week, a new parable. This week, two for the price of one. Now, last week, I told you that parables have a surplus of meaning. They don't just mean one thing once and for all. They're not like puzzles that have a single, simple solution. They are a doorway into mystery. They pose more questions than they answer. And if we sit with them long enough, they teach us something surprising about life or something surprising about God. 
So at lunch, you can imagine how thrilled I was when one of you shared an interpretation of last week's parable that I had never heard before. In fact, it was so creative and insightful that it kept me up. I turned it over and over in my head. Last week, we read about the parable of the sower, a farmer who throws seeds on the good soil and on the driveway alike. And as you'd expect, some of the seed grows and the rest withers. What if, this person asked me, the farmer is angry? What if his frantic throwing of the seeds is an act of desperate rage? God, if the good stuff isn't growing, maybe I'll just throw some seeds on the rocks. And the parable reminds us that no matter how worked up we get, the good stuff will only grow where the soil is ready and deep. They're just stories. So I want to say it again, what I said last week. Just because I have the robes and the pulpit and the live microphone does not mean that my interpretation is the interpretation. The parable does not have a single solution. It's a doorway into mystery. Something to wrestle with to see where it takes you. Here's where it takes me. The good shepherd, Jesus says, will lay down his life for his sheep. He's always with them, always close. The sheep know his voice and follow him. If we're going to call that good shepherding, then we might have to say that the story that we just heard is the parable of the bad shepherd, or at least the parable of the reckless shepherd. Listen to it again. Jesus says, which one of you, having a hundred sheep, if one went missing, wouldn't leave the 99 in the wilderness to go looking for the one that was lost. Now the wilderness, that's an important word. He doesn't say how many of you would leave the 99 sheep nice and buttoned up in the barn and go looking for the one that was lost. How many of you wouldn't leave 99 sheep in the wilderness to go looking for one that is lost? Now, if Jesus was talking to a crowd of people and there was a decent shepherd in the bunch, he would have said, not me, I probably wouldn't. Leave 99 sheep out in the wilderness to go looking for one? That's not the way I was taught. Leaving behind the whole flock to go looking for one that's missing? That's too risky. So why is Jesus telling us a story about a shepherd who doesn't have enough sense to cut his losses? One missing sheep is unfortunate, but out of a flock of a hundred, I mean, is it that bad? Is it, is it worth leaving 99 unattended in a dangerous place just to go looking for the one that got lost? Actually, I, I think it, it's not fair to the 99 sheep who didn't wander off. Why should they be left alone just because one of the other sheep couldn't keep up, couldn't stay with the program? And it's as if Jesus can anticipate the question that he ups the ante. This time it's not sheep, it's brothers. And it's not a hapless sheep that wanders away as sheep are wont to do. This time the brother takes his father's money and squanders it. 
He blows through it on shallow living and cheap thrills and fleeting satisfaction. So if you were tempted to feel some sympathy for the lost sheep, it just wandered off. That's all. Jesus wants to make sure we don't miss the point. Look at this brother. He did this to himself. No one to blame but himself. And so what's the kingdom of heaven like? Well, it's like that brother who comes back to the celebration of a lifetime. The best food, the best clothes, and a seat of honor. The good brother, the one who lived well and followed all the rules, he is so angry that he can't even bring himself to attend the party. Here's what I see in these parables. It seems to me like God is getting attached to the kind of people that cause trouble. Just think about who Jesus spent time with, the sort of people that God can't quite seem to let go of, the problem children, the chronic sinners, the addicts, the ones who make us weary. These are the ones who God goes after time and time again, and I wonder if you know a situation like this. I know plenty. Is there someone in your family, someone at work, someone who seems to get more and more attention because they need it, even if sometimes you're tempted to think they just don't deserve it, and if sometimes it seems like they're not even grateful for it? That's what our life is like. And the shepherd, the reckless shepherd, that's what God is like. That's what God's kingdom is like, a place where the needs of the lowly are met with love time and time again, even if it doesn't seem fair. The kingdom of God is the place where those who have squandered the most, those who we are tempted to think maybe don't deserve another chance, those who have exhausted our capacity to love them or care for them, those are the ones in whom God delights. Those are the ones that God is searching for. And so when Jesus' detractors got upset that he was eating with the wrong people, he told them this story to remind them that God's love doesn't follow our rules. God's love doesn't flow through the channels that we carve. It cascades over the boundaries to touch those that we might otherwise think are lost. God's love insists on reaching out to the broken and lifting up the lowly. God's love extends to those who we find it hard to love. And we are called as followers of Jesus to love in the same way, as best we can. We're called to set aside our own notions of who is worthy and to seek the outsiders and invite them in to look for the brokenhearted and the sick and the poor and to bring them a portion that matches their need. Now, if you're the kind of person who doesn't wander too far astray, if you're the kind of person who does what you are supposed to most days and who follows the rules, it can be hard learning to live with a God who is maddeningly in love with the people who seem to cause all of your problems. But that's what God is like. There's this idea that's been around for a long time that divides people on the margins of society into two categories, the deserving and the undeserving poor. The deserving poor are people like widows and orphans, those who are injured in war or who suffer from chronic illness. The undeserving poor 
are those whose downfall seems to be of their own making. Addicts, single parents, people who can't seem to keep a job or high school dropouts. This is what we do. We divide the world into categories, deserving and undeserving, and then we help the people who seem to have just had bad luck and we leave the rest to deal with the consequences of their decisions. And just when it seems like it might be settled and clear, along comes Jesus. Walking side by side with the least deserving outcasts of his day to tell us this story. A story about a reckless shepherd who goes looking for the one sheep that wandered off. About a father who threw a lavish party for the son who squandered half his fortune. That's how the world looks to God. There are no deserving and undeserving sinners, no deserving and undeserving people. In fact, in God's world, the people who seem the least deserving get the most of God's attention and they are worthy too of your love, your respect, and your care. Now it's hard to love one another in this way. We have limits that God does not, and mercifully, God does not need us to be perfect vessels of grace. But this parable reminds us that God's love is not limited by our ideas of who God's love is for, this parable challenges us each to spend some time with the people who frustrate us or who feel really different than us, and it certainly calls us to expect that we will find God right there by their side when we're with them. Because thankfully, God is a better protector than any shepherd, and God doesn't need to leave any of us behind to go searching, but God does call us from time to time to let our faith journey take us away from a place of gentle comfort, to follow the Spirit in search of people who God has not given up on, the kind of company and friends that made people murmur about Jesus when he called them to his table. We all know people who are hard to love. And that challenge reveals just how deep God's grace is that comes searching time and time again. And that's good news. Because like it or not, someday soon, or maybe in the past, or maybe right now, each one of us will be that lost sheep too. We won't even quite be able to remember how we ended up alone and disoriented, and here comes God, the one who doesn't give up on us, that reckless shepherd searching and calling intent on bringing us back whether we feel like we deserve it or not. Something about the divine nature makes God want to lavish attention on people when they are the most in trouble. Something about who God is makes the Holy One pour out the most profound mercy on the people that are the hardest to love. And sometimes we are the lost one, rejoicing in God's enduring love for us. And sometimes we need the grace to step back and see that God has gone searching somewhere we don't quite understand. But no matter what, take heart and know that whenever we're lost, whether we deserve it or not, God will come looking for us too, no matter what.
you may be seated. This is our time of prayer, a time for us to speak and listen to the Holy One who knows what we need before we ask, and yet who we call out to from the fullness of our joy and the depth of our sorrow. If you have a prayer that you would like to share with this community, please do so now. Prayers for Kelly. A prayer for my niece, Heidi, who is due this week with her first Prayers for Heidi, too. I'll lift up in prayer all those for whom this winter storm was deadly and destructive who are waking up this morning to a different world. Let us pray. God, our shepherd, we give you thanks for your grace and your mercy, for guiding us by your loving hand for leading us beside still waters and bringing us peace. We give you thanks for healing us and feeding us, for caring for us, and for searching us out whenever we are lost. God, for your wild love that flows over boundaries, and moves in places that we could not even imagine. We give you thanks. Let that love and that mercy crash over each of us. Fill us up with a sense of your love for each of us. Holy God, seek out also the lost in the world beyond these walls. Find the sick and the hurting, the lonely and the afraid. Find the prisoners and the outcasts. Find all of those who seek the light of your love and those who don't even yet know how much they need it. Find them each and fill them with your peace and your mercy. And teach us, too, how to bear such love to the world. God, we thank you that you hear our prayers lifted up with our voices. And we thank you, too, that you listen inwardly to the prayers that rest in our hearts the prayers too deep for words that we lift in silence now to you. Here too, O God, all our prayers contained in these reliable words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, in our ministry, we strive to bring the light of God's love to all who are lost. We strive to seek out the brokenhearted and those on the margins, to touch them with the love of God that we experience in this place. Your offerings are an important part of how we carry out this ministry in the name of Christ, our shepherd. Our offerings now will be given and received. We give you thanks for the generosity that has brought us together. Bless us and dedicate us now to be stewards of your love to the lost. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. <laughs>
May you go now to bear God's love and God's light into the lost and hurting places in our world. And may you go with the assurance and the peace to know that when you are lost, God will come looking. God will come searching for you again and again, no matter what, and bring you home. May our shepherd God, who loves us so, bless you and keep you this day and forevermore. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.